Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 723, that is 723 of the Agostino Zynga show and I hope you are doing well wherever this podcast may find you, I hope you are doing swimmingly. How am I? All good, all things considered, I cannot complain, I cannot complain, I cannot complain. There are some interesting rumours going around when it concerns Man United in terms of the ownership and the 25% stake that Sir Jim Ratcliffe has purchased. Um, essentially, it's looking more and more like the Glazers played the entire fan base like a fiddle. They basically pretended like they wanted to sell the entire club and move on and give us a fresh break that we've all been longing for and dying for and protesting for and screaming for and hashtag Glazers out for and wearing our green and gold banners and flipping scarves for. They gave us the impression they weren't to sell, but in the end, they didn't really want to sell. When the Qataris came in with a bid that was over the market value, I think the market, if I'm not mistaken, values us at around five million or some five billion, sorry. And then I think the Qatari group put in a bid of like six or seven. So they, you know, they basically paid above the market value for it or they bid above the market value the Glazers basically didn't really respond to the offer didn't reject it but didn't respond I think that gave all United fans a lot of nervous feelings and then when the stories came out about why they'd refused to engage with the Qatari group it made it seem like the Glazers are hell-bent on making the fan base suffer like they're trying to get us back for all the years of embarrassment that we've caused to them with our campaigns to get them out with the hashtags with the chants with the you know many many podcast interviews and youtube channels out there people criticizing the glazers it seems like their way to get back at us is to kind of slowly kill us you know death by a thousand cuts type of style so they rejected the Qatari group offer to buy the club out in four and now it looks like they're pining more or basically they're in the final stages of negotiation with Sir Jim Ratcliffe for 25% and it's quite a clever deal to be fair because essentially they've got Sir Jim Ratcliffe to pay 25% to pay for 25% ownership which isn't a lot um, which still isn't a controlling amount you know there's a suggestion that he's going to have control over the sporting side of things but I'm not going to give anybody the benefit of the doubt the Gators have had a real stranglehold on the club operations for a very long time for them to suddenly relinquish that control makes no sense and there is rumours out there now that the final decision making person in that process is still going to be Richard Arnold so it doesn't really change or there's still going to be sorry a Glazer that's going to be in charge of like signing stuff off so even if Sergio Ratcliffe and his team of sports people want to push for a certain player to be signed they still have to get final Glazer sign off the reason why I bring this up is just to say it's just amazing just how much this stuff is like we're not in our control you know and I think I've said this before in plenty of times that part of the reason why I think I'm so level-headed and so grounded when it comes to politics and world issues is because of how fanatical I am about football and because of the current turmoil my club Man United is going in going through because I'm basically helpless, right? We we all know the issues of why Man United are not back where they should be or not back where they were beforehand, right? Or why they're not competing for the big trophies or why they're not sustaining a good league challenge. We know why that issue is. And it all comes down to the ownership. The ownership has been the one consistent factor since Alex uh, Ferguson got away from the club. The owners haven't changed. Managers have. Some players have. But the one thing that's been a constant has been the Glazers. And we know that as soon as we get rid of these owners who care more about the commercial business side of things or the sporting side of things, we might be back where we need to be. But for the time being, it's not going to change because they own the club and it's, you know, they don't have any incentive to sell it. Um, they can keep taking our dividends. They don't need to invest any money into the club. Like it's just become essentially like a living, breathing cash machine for them. And, you know, if you look at it from a really cold business point of view, why would they sell? Imagine a scenario. This is a nightmare scenario for United fans. Imagine a scenario where Sonja Ratcliffe puts in some money for 25%. He gets allegedly this control on the sporting side of things and we have an upturn in results. Maybe we finish second in the Premier League. Maybe we win the FA Cup. Maybe we even challenge for the Champions League one season. We get to the semi-finals or something. Something crazy like that. Guess what will happen? That will just increase the value of the club. The club becomes much more valuable. Then further down the line, there's always a scenario that exists there where the guys can say, hey, 
if you want to buy the remaining shares of this club, you're going to have to pay above and beyond what the previous offers was from the Qatari group because now we're in a much better place. We've kind of, you know, renovated the stadium. Maybe they've, you know, expanded the training facility or built a new one. Maybe they've got some new exciting players. Whatever the thing is, there is a scenario that exists where if Sir Jim Ratcliffe does a good job, we could actually have the Glazers have control or ownership of our club for way longer than what we would have hoped. So in actuality, if you actually want change, <laughs> this is really dark. If you want change, you actually have to hope for the Glazers to fail and for United to fail. You have to pray for our downfall. Every week that we play, you have to hope that we lose. You have to hope that we miss chances. You have to hope that the teams around us pull away. And then maybe closer and closer we get to finishing in the bottom half of the table and how bad that is for PR. Maybe the Glazers then will be forced to relinquish control and sell. Maybe. But until then, we're doomed. Anyway, talking about doomed and talking about things that aren't that great. Um, I was thinking a lot, actually, about um, my friend Joshua Sweeney passing. So RIP Joshua Sweeney always. RIP Joshua Sweeney always. And one thing that always, that kind of like grub, that kind of I've been mulling over, actually, is the idea of like, the only thing you remember somebody with once they pass is pictures. And I'm really fortunate in that that time when I was growing up, the time like when I left to go to even though even when I was at a church actually, I've got I just checked my flicker now. I need to find out a way how I can make it all public. Maybe I have to kind of like edit it and shit, but I've got an entire flicker full of just pictures from many, many, many years ago that I need to flip it, make sure that I tighten up and shit, and maybe even download them all from Flickr in case Flickr ends up going under. But essentially from when I was a teenager I would always have a camera on me I'd have like a little SLR on me I have a little digital camera 35 millimeter camera I was always the one snapping pictures and most of it came because I was trying to copy like you know um Cobra Snake and I forgot who the other guy was there's this other dude who basically I think he was maybe Persian or something he kind of like a pirate and that's an Arab parrot that's his name I don't know if you guys remember this guy called Arab Parrot back in the day, but him and Cobra Snake was two of the biggest dudes on the scene who were doing really great nightlife pictures. And this other guy too, this other black guy, because well, I think his name is Bronkes or something from um, last night's party. And that whole entire nightlife photography scene was something that I lived for. And I think when I was growing up, a lot of it had to do with the fact that I had such a rigid and you know um life where i wasn't really allowed to go out um i grew up in a really religious home really strict and stuff you know standard african parent stuff so i guess i sort of like fantasized and you know um mystified the flipping outside right i made it seem like it was more amazing than what it actually was in the end it just ended up being like clubs with people drinking and doing drugs really it wasn't that amazing but when you're somebody that's super sheltered and you're not really allowed out that much going out and experiencing that things at night is really amazing so i picked up the hobby of just having my camera with me all the time and then i guess when i then started to you know have friends and my social group started to increase the benefit of having a camera was pretty sick because I would always be documenting our nights. Sometimes I think they didn't really like it because I was always have a camera on me. I'd have like a little flipping flash thing on top of it and shit. I'd be always recording stuff. So maybe if you're trying to get up to some madness and you see me chopping around in my flipping big head with my little SLR camera wrapped around my waist, you probably weren't too happy to see me. But the good thing about it is that since met you know now many years have gone by since that time and a lot of people i don't even speak to anymore i've got the memories of the pictures and instantly as soon as i see the pictures it kind of transports me to that moment and usually you know i'm somebody that doesn't really have the greatest memory anyway in general i'm sure all the years of like drinking and doing drugs hasn't helped but in general i've never really had the greatest memory i think that's also another like you know another issue that I probably should be talking to a psychiatrist about because I think a lot of the reasons why I don't have a great memory is that I do on purpose like I purposely like you know um factory reset myself head wise memory wise because I don't want to remember some stuff because some memories are really hurtful some are painful um you know whatever it may be so I just try to delete them from my brain I guess I do that all the time and, and then I started doing it as a way to like cope with loss so if I ended up like you know quote unquote breaking up with a friend a way to just get over it was just delete it from my brain and to the point where I'd literally forget the person's name really toxic because you know you're friends with that person and you, you know a good way to deal with those issues is obviously talk to somebody or talk to them but my way of dealing with it was just to kind of delete it from my brain so I didn't remember it at all but whenever I see a picture I'm instantly transported to that place and time 
instantly without a shadow of a doubt so um what it made me think of when you know the unfortunate news came that Joshua Sweeney passed away and I dig through my pictures to see and to remember kind of the good times that we had together instantly I kind of felt to myself wow man I regret all the time I wasted in between you know what I mean because I couldn't even remember like legitimately I tell you now I can't honestly remember why exactly we fell out I know we did fall out for something but I don't think it was that deep you know that's the issue of just mostly pride ego and all that shit got in the way and I'm not really somebody that could could that easily like you know offers out my hand and says sorry I'm, I'm just not that guy so um especially when it gets to that point where I feel like I've been disrespected or something because I always feel like I'm a decent enough human I'm sure I, I'm sure on the other side of things people could say I'm a piece of shit but on my side of things I think usually I go about my I try to go out my way to be a nice person so if somebody doesn't reciprocate that I have this oftentimes you know uh automatic sort of response to just like block them or block them out completely delete them from my my memory factory reset them you don't exist i don't remember nothing like fuck off do you know what i mean type of vibe to a point where it'll get physical like it's really crazy how weird and kind of twisted my brain is in that regard which probably helps that i don't have friends because i don't think that sort of brain and that sort of way of dealing with people is really the great way to make friends right it probably isn't the best way but Honestly, when I saw those pictures of Josh Sweeney and stuff, it made me remember, it made me honestly regret all the time in between that I wasted, not just picking up the phone, not texting, not saying something. And I have to be honest, like, I can't even lie and say I didn't think about it. Like, in the last couple of months I did, it did cross my mind here and there because I'd see his profile picture pop up on my, like, suggested, oh, this person, you should follow them or something. And I'd be like... <sighs> I should say something in it, but then I, I'll just like move on straight away. Um, because obviously in my head, I, I decided, yep, that person's deleted, they're gone from my life. And it's not even like an op thing. It's not even like I saw them as an op. It's just more so like, I don't know why my brain works like that. I think it's, again, I think it's just my way to cope with loss when I feel like I've lost something, especially a friendship, because I feel like those things are honestly way more hurtful than losing a relationship, especially on my side of things, because maybe I come in a little bit too hot, maybe I'm a little bit too much, who knows, people are like, hey, leave me alone now, um, or there's that whole lifestyle shaming thing people do with you, and it was like, oh, you know, I've moved on, I'm not in the party anymore, and you're the party guy, and I, you're a bad influence, whatever it may be, which is obviously the wrong thing to say, because it's not even like I, you know, I'm on that same level anymore, but again, I'm also not the person that wants to explain myself. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to justify my existence and try to convince you that I don't party as much. It's like, no, if you think that, you think that, no problem. But also, you know, you're dead to me kind of thing. So that was my kind of like my mood. Um, but it just made me think that in general, going forward, I've been doing it anyway. I'm definitely going to make sure that I'm carrying my camera around with me all the flipping time. You know, it's so handy to have those memories where you can kind of look back and think, rah, man, we have so, so many great times. Um, and it's a shame that, you know, he's not around anymore, obviously. Um, that's clearly the worst part of it. But at least, at least, especially for someone like myself, who isn't the most um you know friendly in that respect doesn't really have the best tact when it comes to dealing with people at least i have these memories where i can kind of savor and look upon and think yeah man we had a good time you know and i think sometimes as well like i said before as great as it is to be like you know trying to rescue situations rescue relationships and friendships and moments and stuff i think it's also very important to just savor that time that you had that memory and just leave it there you know sometimes because when you try and chase things I've, I've experienced it myself in recent years like and you think you think one thing about the memory because again look, these especially when it's a shared experience one person has one side of one person has one view of that experience the other person has another view of the experience and you can't influence the other person to feel like the way that you feel it just isn't just doesn't make any sense really so you have to just leave the person to you know have whatever emotion they have or don't have and then you hold on to whatever you hold on to but trying to chase it can sometimes sully it to the point where you would regret ever reaching out to that person and i've been that guy so i recommend that you don't do that if possible but yeah man it's been a tough one i'm not gonna lie um it's not been tough as in like sadness it's just been more so like wow man like you know like getting to age where like friends are dying and you're like shit and I guess it would be it would be more understandable if it was like a lifestyle thing. I don't know, guy went skateboarding, going out and stuff, maybe some drug stuff, but it's not. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, yeah, it's it's mad, man. It's it's really mad. You get to that point now, but um, and the other part as well, me, I kind of I think, and I think I think that's why maybe I haven't really been the greatest in terms of social media stuff because I think in general you kind of have to 
put that moral principled stance thing to one point to one side because I even felt super lame even posting my little tribute that I did on Instagram I haven't even logged back into my account since I posted I'm just like I, I don't want to see you know the outpouring of support and stuff is just going to make me upset and stuff so but I posted what I posted and I felt lame about posting it because like I said I hadn't really even spoken to the guy in the last few years do you know what I mean like we legitimately were strangers I had legitimately haven't spoken to him in ages but again we had in a very intense and close relationship for a very long time during our very formative years and then all of a sudden nothing you know what I mean because of some miscommunication because of some I don't know what happened I really don't I wish I could remember what actually happened what led to us not talking but whatever it was it wasn't worth it and um yeah man like I, I even felt fake even posting that I felt like you know what what am I doing like I haven't spoken to the guy and here I am posting a tribute as if like we're like the closest buddy we were the closest buddies at that point which obviously isn't the point you know I'm honoring his legacy I understand that but I just felt so fake and lame you know and I think people do that anyway isn't it, right they just post something a tribute about somebody especially somebody famous and you saw a lot happen with Virgil it was fucking disgusting especially for me because you know I was kind of in the inside when I was working with him or worked with a company that worked with him and I saw how the people in the industry reacted to him when he was on his you know on his come up and a lot of these people were like saying mad bad things about this guy behind his back you know to us of course because they, they, they knew we wouldn't report back to him or I was in the same scene I could hear these sort of things and then to see these guys like turn around and start pretending that they were best friends and you know eulogizing him in the text and stuff and sharing sms's and dms that like, gross 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 so um that made me feel awful and again that's different because that's a flipping you know that's a famous person but i don't know i just felt so fake posting it. i really did it took me a while to post it um and then when i did i just didn't want to look at it again so um yeah man it's been a tough one i'm not gonna lie just to kind of process in my head really in that respect because you know the guy was there and now he's not here anymore and um yeah man and we didn't really have a chance to piece it up or anything that's a really bad thing about it and it's not even about me it's just more so like raw like I took time for granted I actually thought yeah we're gonna figure it out along the way or we won't you know and now we won't ever figure it out it's just kind of gone forever so yeah I don't know what message to take from that really or what you can take from that but that was just rummaging through my head and I was just trying to process it and make some sort of sense of it you know how it is anyways um to lighten the mood a little bit um I have bumped into my first guy at the gym who wears jeans to work out and i'm not talking about like picture this right because in my head whenever some people talk to me about oh whenever no whenever someone would mention to me oh my god i was in a gym one time and i saw some guy with jeans in my head the way i'd rationalize it was like because i'm I, I love rationalizing crazy i could understand a scenario where a couple of lads or maybe one lad before a night out in the town decides to just you know maybe leave their house an hour and a half before they leave you know maybe maybe you take a little maybe you buy maybe you wear like one of those primark t-shirts or something right it's not the greatest quality but it's like a two pound t-shirt and you have a nice t-shirt in your bag or something right a little, little plastic bag or something and then you go to the gym with your outfit and stuff and you just get a little pump on you hit the dumbbells you maybe hit the cables you maybe do a bit of bench maybe some push-ups wide narrow diamond maybe some dips, maybe some pull-ups, like whatever you can do to get a good upper body, chest, back, arm, shoulders pump. And then when you finish, you might do a little bit of a dry shampoo thing, maybe a quick rinse under the thing. And then you leave and you put your flipping shirt on to go and to meet your friends to pre-drink before you go on a night out. I could see that scenario and you probably chucked the flipping Primark t-shirt in the bin. I could see that scenario. It's kind of crazy, but I could see why you could do that. Or even if you wanted to just put on your full outfit and just go into the, the, the gym quickly and just quickly smash the curls. Do a little 20 minute set of just that boom, boom, boom. Put some deodorant on, a bit of fragrance, jump on the central line, off to Liverpool Street, you go. I could see that scenario happening. But I didn't see that. What I saw was a guy who, I don't know, had finished work or something and just went to the gym in his jeans. So instead of going home and changing, he just thought, fuck it, I'm just going to go to the gym with my jeans. That's the kind of guy that I saw. And he was honestly wearing the type of outfit that you'd wear. Like, I've worked in offices like this before, where Monday to Thursday, you're kind of like in a suit type of thing. And then on a Friday, you're allowed to wear like relaxed clothing, right? Kind of like business casual. And you had like, on these little jeans, these little like smartest trainers, blah, blah, blah. 
and he wore that to the gym. I was like, wow. Like basically his workout fit with just like gloves on, like workout gloves. I was like, fucking hell. That is wild. Like actually wild. You couldn't go to the, your house quickly, put on some shorts and come to the gym. No, I'm just going to train. And he's wearing like actual skinny jeans as well. I couldn't imagine anything worse to being in the gym with. Everyone's sweating around. You've got these fucking clangers on like the, you know, I think for me, especially when I used to work in an office, like taking off your jeans after hard days of work, especially a pair of skinny jeans was like when a girl takes off their bra, you know, be like, oh, you felt amazing. So I couldn't imagine extending that time just to go and sit around in the gym someplace. But I saw that guy in the gym. I was like, wow, man, you're actually in here in your like Friday after work gear instead of going to the bar. Imagine how popular that guy is in his fucking workplace. I said it before, like, you know, how important it is sometimes in some workplaces. This is really bad to be really good at the social side of things sometimes it's way better than actually being good at your job which is fucking odd but it happens a lot so imagine how popular you you are if you're the kind of person that you ditch the friday after work drinks and then instead you go to the gym in your jeans <laughs> absolute sicko behavior and also imagine dude sweat a lot i know i did when i was had that when i when i was working in an office like physically with people I used to sweat just sitting down like I sweat just normally so you can imagine what I must be like when I'm on the fucking when I'm on when I pop the molly and I'm sweating but day to day I sweat a lot anyway so just imagine daily work sweat going to lunch sweat you know jump running around talking to your colleagues sweat commuting sweat and then you're in the fucking gym absolutely wild but yeah I saw that guy that guy impressed me big up him for being in there i also noticed a little tiny thing as well a little tiny microaggression i've noticed with me in the gym you know what i really love doing i really love when i'm working out in the gym and i'm in the little rack section right and maybe the guy opposite me or the guy across or whatever is about to work out too and then they put on their gloves and i just get out my chalk my little uh you know weightlifting chalk i just rub that on my hands and i put you know grab the barbell, do my obed presses, my back squats, my barbell rows, my deadlifts, whatever I need to do with that barbell, I just put some choke, some nice, you know, some good old, honest, hard, you know, um, working class, blue collar chalk on my hands, rub it together and just grab the barbell. You feel so much, you feel so much more manly than the guy across from you who has to put on these gloves with like gel padding and all this sort of nonsense like he legitimately looks like he's got like mma gloves on with the amount of padding these gloves have got on them right whereas i'm just going like straight up now don't get me wrong my hands do, do end up looking like the inside of my hands are super calloused right i've got calluses all over my fucking hands and they're very rough like i don't have drake hands drake has like his hands look legitimately like he fucking you know um sleeps you know overnight with them dipped in fucking honey and shit they look absolutely amazing but you know even though i have cases over my hands it just it just makes me feel more manly that i have to put on gloves and i'm glad that's kind of like my um crossfit um experience that's kind of taught me that um and that's actually a good way to kind of get into weightlifting isn't it really that crossfit route where it's just really bare bones it's no it's no crazy shit even sometimes belts aren't encouraged because they want you to um have control of your you know of your fucking of your core essentially right they want you to always be conscious of your form of your core they don't want you to have terrible you know form when you're when you're flipping squatting they want you to always think of different cues all these type of things so that if you want to use a belt you can later on but the belt isn't a sort of like um isn't a correction tool for bad form and stuff and um, for bad habits you already get the habits locked in and that all comes from being bare bones you know all about the barbell all about the weights all about the free weights and stuff and cardio and tabata training and all that malarkey and then of course no gloves because you know you're never going to see a guy in the crossfit gym with gloves and so maybe knee straps and stuff and wristbands um whatever but you're never going to see them with gloves, which is a good thing. So I've been happy about that. I've been happy about that. So moving on to the show, we need to talk about Berghain. Berghain have released their December 2023 um, lineup and it looks pretty cool. The big one for me, which I'm considering actually going to, is the one on December, which one is it here? December the 9th. It's actually their 19th anniversary. Can you believe that? 19 years of Berghain slash Panorama 
is happening on Saturday, the 9th of December. Now, usually I would say that I try to avoid these occasions, right? I've said it before plenty of times, but the special occasions at Berghain are crazy. Like the last time I went to one, it was the Club Sylvester that happened in like maybe June, July or something. Or maybe it was February, whenever it was. There was one that happened previously this year. Um, maybe not the one before last maybe, maybe it was the one before last it was the one that they made up for i think they, they couldn't do it at the time they were going to do it then they kind of did it in the middle of the year i went to that one and let me tell you that's the longest i've ever had to wait to go into burger and ever in my life and i think embarrassingly enough i'm going to tell you this right now don't tell anybody i wait for four hours yes four fucking hours and to be fair it might have been longer i'm not really sure but one thing that I can excuse myself for was that I was there by myself I got there quite early and the queue was relatively short it just filled up really quickly unfortunately like I think when I joined the queue it was just by the little um the little fucking portable spatty guy and then you know it didn't really move much within those kind of four hours it was just I wasn't even that far I wasn't like super super far back behind I was basically just as the grav where the gravel starts where you're about to queue and then um obviously because it's a celebration people were you know jumping the queue the guest's queue was also super big but it was just one of those times where it was just really full inside it just wasn't easier to kind of wait and it got so bad that um for the first time in a long time I saw the bouncers actually walk down the queue and start shouting out hey it's only one in one out where I could capacity now blah, blah 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 but obviously you know if you're experienced driver you know what the deal you don't listen to that sort of shit you just sit there and let the you know newbies or people that are pissed off to go and then that leaves you more chance to get in i eventually did get in and i had a fucking whale of a time but it needs to be said that if you're somebody that goes to Berghain or wants to go to Berghain, you would know that these special events are usually very hit and miss but for me I think this might be a hit. Why? Because it's in December and it's not during the summer because usually the summer events, whether it's um the Berlin, the May Day, whether it's, uh, what you call it, uh, Berlin Pride and a few other things, they're usually in the summer months where everyone kind of goes and they get a bit too crazy. There's probably too many tourists there, too many normies as well. I don't think it's just a tourist because the tourists get a bad rap um, for ruining the vibe in Bergheim, but I think it's also just a normie crowd of people in Germany and in Berlin anyway who just want to go there because, you know, they've got great fucking train, um, you know, uh, systems and whatever it may be services sorry they've got train good train services across mainland europe um especially in other parts of germany you can easily get to berlin within an hour um if you live near a nearby city and stuff so there's plenty of people that go there just to party during the summer so of course they are on it and they're having a good vibe so sometimes they can go there and a bit too steamy and kind of ruin the vibe of the place and stuff so it can be weird in the summer but i think this 90th anniversary of it being in december it might be a hit because if i've you know from what i've been able to gather checking on the my favorite flipping subreddit and all subreddits a bergan community subreddit from what i've been able to gather from some of the reports on people because they always do these really good little updates on people posting um their experience in there how long the queue is blah 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 blah. they got bounced and from what i've been able to surmise ever since maybe the end of october the mood and the kind of vibe in there has changed considerably and if you would have seen threads that were posted from like february on to like you know september you would have seen definitely people complaining about the vibe and um, some people even saying that it's too straight nine burger and all this sort of stuff right but now you're seeing people actually say no nah, they're enjoying um going out there a lot more and i think that's probably something that could apply to the whole of berlin too because obviously when i go there i'm just going to one club and going to fucking all the clubs right oxy rso um you know aiden and um, watergate trezor it doesn't matter i'm going to all of them right every everything every every toilet i'm going into something's gonna get sniffed so <laughs> i'm doing that right so i think i'm definitely gonna go for this 19th anniversary one in december because it has a bit of an interesting day again like i said because it's on december to have that kind of a timing go in there and of course the lineup is fucking killer right so 19th of um sorry the 9th of december 19th anniversary you got absolute plane amx you got ben clock um you got best best hero ds dvs1 um, dvs1 has been getting an interesting kind of bit of reviews online um i've seen some people comparing him a lot to that the freddie k phenomenon because a lot of people from Berghain like eulogize freddie k i still haven't been convinced i still think he's a bit overrated personally in my opinion i think he's a bit overrated i haven't heard a closing Berghain set from freddie k i haven't seen him play in berlin at his home turf i know i've already got the experience of seeing him playing e1 and playing in fold 
and also you know live streams right that's the only experience i've got and from what i've been able to gather so far not a bit overrated for me in my personal opinion and i think dvs ones get a similar sort of treatment and a lot of people are saying that you know the hype maybe you know is a little bit over overdone but I'm interested to see him regardless because, again, the times that I've seen him, Devious One play, he's definitely impressed me. He impresses me more than Freddie K, if that has to be said. Luke Slater has been having an absolute tear in Bergheim recently, I think. I think like every other month he's already playing there, so big up him. So that's to be great to see him as well. Marcel Dietman will be nice and it's called Nymed is also playing. But the best for me is definitely the Panorama bar. Might be actually better than the Bergheim bar. Uh, Bergheim lineup, sorry. In Panabar, you got Arm from Innovision playing, you got Gerd Jansen, you got Matellus Pittman, Natalie Robinson, you got Ogazon, who's somebody that I kind of discovered more so through Hoare. Um, so big up her, that'd be sick to see her play there. You got Roman Flugel, that'd be sick to see him play there. Um, you got Stacey Hotwax Hale and Virginia, so that'd be sick. And then in Hale Room, you got Dasha Rush playing live, which would be sick. I'm not really seeing what her live sets look like or what that sound would sound like. You got um Nazanin Nori, you got at can be Marco Shuttle, Shape and Noise, and then in Saw, you got a person called Disius playing live. But this is a really, really good lineup to check out. So I'm definitely um, keeping my eye out from that one and definitely going to go check out to see it and if I can go and enjoy and have a good time because that'll be a good one as well to get out of my system before the new year because I don't usually party during the new year anyway. Um, that's not something I've done in a very, very long time. So this might be a good way to kind of like cure two birds with one stone where you can go and party during that kind of close enough to the new year. It'll also be bitterly cold in Berlin, and I love it when it's cold. I don't know why, but I fucking love it when the big parker, like, you know, pull out my fucking veteran thing, um, long, long coats, like, big boots. You know what I mean? Like, I love that fucking weather. Actually, I think I love it more so because, if I'm not mistaken, the weather, obviously, it's really cold in Berlin, but, you know, you know how, what the vibe is in Berlin when it's cold. But also, I don't know, because the usually the cloakrooms are really cheap, the clubs are really warm and everyone's fucking sweating off their faces on drugs or drinking and shit. You can afford to just go into the club just with a massive coat and wearing a t-shirt and a vest underneath and then just leave, you know, in the morning and stuff and you're perfectly fine. So I love that ability of just not having to take too much shit with me, you know? Um, not, you know, thinking about the rain or whatever. So just kind of going in there, boom, and then kind of going out. So I'm really, 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 really eager to go. So I can't really wait to check that out, uh, to be honest. So big up, Bergheim. Um, 19th anniversary happening very, very soon. And of course, the rest of December lineup is also out but they haven't updated um the lineups yet about the what you call it for the new year's eve and new year's day basically party it's more new year's day party but yeah they haven't updated that one lineup that i thought was really interesting and kind of maybe is a sign of i wouldn't say a sellout or maybe toy tonic is going in an interesting direction because toy tonics i mentioned before were one of the best parties i've discovered maybe in recent years and obviously a label and everything else in between but this collaboration they've got with Spandu 20 happening on the 22nd of December is really interesting because it seems like it's a purposeful, you know, pivot because the parties are ramping up it seems that they're doing a party every single fucking weekend when you check their instagram account right you get nothing but utter fomo from their account but also this link up with spandu might be the beginning of the end as much as i love toy tonics like you know when you collaborate with fiac and all these mandem you know underneath and stuff it's not it's only going to go one way and you know what the spandu crowd is like you know I don't think most people would want to go to those type of parties willingly. So it's a shame to see Toy Tonics go in that direction. And it kind of makes me respect more, you know, Gerd Jansen's decision with running back to not really turn it into it. Because I think Gerd Jansen could have easily turned running back into a Toy Tonics or whatever. Or even people, or even a group like Public Possession, who've been kind of, you know, low key, doing everything kind of small and stuff and not really blowing up too much. Um, you kind of have to give those guys a lot of respect because I feel like Toy Tonics have got, you know, they've kind of grown massively over the last 18 months and now they've got to a point where they're doing collab parties with spandu um in burger and in panorama bar which again you know lineup is sick and stuff i get it but it just feels like to me this might be the beginning of the end so i'm um, shame to see that but apart from that we haven't really got any dates for the new year's day events just yet so keep an eye out for that if you are that way indeed inclined but for me so far of course it has to be that 90th anniversary december as well there won't be much tourists around like myself or normies so it'll be great to go there and have a good time and wail out so again cannot wait to go cannot wait to go nothing is all talking about another thing i was 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 talking about we have to talk about pink pantress new album heaven knows that just dropped right um this might be a contender for me for album of the year 
she absolutely delivered this might be a contender for album of the year for me and there's not a lot this year like i think i mentioned maybe diddy's album um i think i might have mentioned caroline uh palachek's album there might be not that many really this year that have been really you know standouts a lot of them have been kind of underwhelming but pink pantress's album heaven knows absolutely special number one number one thing to kind of point out about it is just the the concise nature of it right just really short album 13 tracks um no real no real fluff um, everything is kind of very 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 well considered in terms of a track listing and if i'm not mistaken i think i think if i'm not mistaken it falls under like i think it falls under like 40 minutes i think total runtime i'm checking on my phone yeah is it yeah it's 34 minutes actually it's even shorter than that so it's a 34 minute album and for some reason it doesn't feel like it it takes you on such different journeys um different sort of you know sounds and sonics and vibes and moods and textures and stuff it's just it really does take you on a journey and it honestly doesn't feel like a 34 minute um length album it definitely does feel a little bit longer the tracks even though some of them are super short in length they feel really full they go in all different different directions personally i think sonically um the beats are incredible you get that kind of y2k pop whispering tinge thing that she does but they all the tracks sound different you know and i think that's something you have to kind of give credit to her and everyone you know of course compare her to a collaborator um what you call it ice spice who's you know responsible for one of her biggest records but i think that's what they both do really well just thinking about off the top of my head they both make very they both make very distinctive music that's kind of in their lane their kind of style right obviously ice spice has that drill sound and um Pink Panthers has got the whole Y2K aesthetic and sound going on with the pop melodies and shit. But what I feel like they do really well is that they make all the tracks sound different. And I think even maybe Olivia Rodrigo does that as well with her kind of pop records. They've got a way of like making the same track, but in different ways on each different album that they put out so it never sounds boring it kind of sounds fresh it's a really interesting way to do it i don't i know it doesn't really make any sense but in my head it's making sense because you think of ice spices like she's made different versions of the same track she blew up from but she's done them in different type of ways with different flows different beats maybe not different flows different beats um maybe they have maybe different flows different approach i'm not really sure it is but it always kind of sounds fresh to your ear and i think pin pandras did the same thing with her album heaven knows it's absolutely incredible and Number one, the the title track just sets it off. And I think you have to give the lady a lot of credit for coming into the album or starting the album, coming into it, you know, pause on that one, but starting the album straight off the bat with a banger, right? Another Life featuring Rima. First of all, when I heard a track, I thought to myself, oh, you know who would have destroyed this? Destroy Lonely. Destroy Lonely would have killed this or yeet or somebody of that ilk they would have absolutely destroyed or ken carson they would have destroyed this as a feature but i thought rima did a good job and oddly enough he actually sounded like them anyway so maybe he kind of you know achieved um he kind of killed two birds with one stone so he had the ability to kind of flex his muscle and show his range and also um she could also collaborate with somebody that was a little bit you know outside maybe of her warehouse but i thought destroy lonely ken carson would have absolutely killed that opening track another life but i just love how she didn't start off with like a slow intro she just came in straight off the bat boom let's go 30 minute you know album let's hit you over the head with it so again i think that takes a lot of bravery to do something like that so big up her for that one but my favorite track actually oddly enough on the entire album is the interlude internet baby I don't know why this gets me so much, but I fucking loved it. And I knew immediately when I saw it in the track list, I thought, you know what? I'm bet I'm gonna love this interlude. And I wanna wish this interlude just went forever and ever. So I actually did find some random person on SoundCloud that looped um the interlude, um, I think for like 30 minutes and shit. So I'm not the only person that fucking enjoys it. Um I thought Central C smashed his feature on the track Nice to Meet You before um on um, the track that I like, of course. I thought he did really well on that one. Um I really like Ophelia as well. That's a really good track. Um and if anything I love the bravery and I love the conviction of starting your album the way she did with Another Life with Rima. Again, we haven't heard any singles from her beforehand that sounded like this anyway. So it was kind of like a fresh way to kind of reintroduce yourself to people. And then she ended the album with the hit record Boys a Liar Part 2 um, with Earth Spice. So 
it wasn't like she tried to sonically slide it into the album to make it make sense and to you know inflate it no i'm gonna give you a look i'm gonna give you 12 of my tracks that i feel like better represent me as an artist because you have to imagine at this point she's probably tired and bored of fucking performing boy is a liar right it's probably doing a fucking nothing so you don't want to keep doing that same thing you don't want to become a monstric pony and also you think of yourself as a real true artist you have much more to offer so you know what i'm going to start my album off with these 12 tracks and then we're going to end it with a track that you know me from but i'm going to give you 12 different looks so you can realize that i'm that girl and she fucking did that i swear to god because this legitimately might be one of my album of the year contenders coming up and i can't wait to kind of recollect everything and go through all them and whatever else i mentioned before in the past obviously and give you my number one or maybe my top five of the year but there haven't been a lot of really good ones especially within the i don't know within the urban rap hip-hop r&b genre vault which is not really hip-hop r&b but still within that kind of you know um bubble there's not been a lot of really good albums this year so she definitely stands out with heaven knows so if you haven't seen it before please please do check it out it's called heaven knows by pink pantress and it's absolutely incredible and again like i said my favorite track on the album is definitely internet baby which i'll definitely play as my um what you're going to tune today at the end of the podcast so if you want to know that the tune of the day today is definitely going to be pink Pantress, the internet baby, Pink Pantress, internet baby. But get the album now, heaven knows, available on all digital streaming platforms. Do not delay, do not delay. Next way to talk about Houdini by Dua Lipa. We have to talk about Houdini by Dua Lipa because the the, the track, the track's probably better than the music video. Let's be fair. The music video is a bit mad because again, maybe, uh, you know, I'm not the most graceful person in the world, but I, I've danced for the majority of my life. I used to dance quite a lot when I was younger. I used to be in classes and shit for it and stuff. And I, you know, I think of myself as a pretty good dancer. And let's be honest, she moves like a fucking transit van. Now, has she improved a lot from that viral meme of her kind of swinging her hips on the stage somewhere? I think it was Coachella or something, right? That she got kind of rightfully bullied for. And then she went back to the drawing board and started actually taking lessons and stuff. And she looks way better when she's doing choreography. Fair enough. But let's be honest, that music video for Houdini with her dancing and stuff, she does move like a transit man she just doesn't have this she's not very graceful it's kind of ungangly and weird and stuff and again it's not her fault it kind of is what it is but take away the music video which is a bit awkward but which is odd i'm saying this because i think you know the market that she's actually appealing to which is gay guys and stuff from what i've been seeing on social media they absolutely love the video i saw one gay guy in particular saying oh this is going to be the video that's going to be played on loop at the gay um pre-session pre-sesh before you go out type of thing so clearly they love it but i personally think the the video is fucking awful and she doesn't dance that great and she doesn't she moves like a fucking you know like a two-footed fucking um deer or something it's really odd anyway before that that aside sorry the track houdini itself masterful it's absolutely incredible it's so fucking good and i realized when i was checking the fucking genius stats of it guess who produced it Yes, you guessed it, Kevin Parker, a.k.a. Tem Impala. And, of course, alongside Danny L. Howe, who is obviously one half of PC Music and, who I'm not mistaken, produced one of my favourite Caroline Palachek tracks called Billions. It all comes around full circle. He, he produced Billions, and I think he also did a few other, you know, big tracks for Caroline Palachek over the years as well. But those two people, you know, Tame Impala, who I've been a fan of since the day they first fucking dropped i love everything kevin parker does and um, if anything houdini makes you know actually makes me sound like i was just thinking what was that track that tame impala did with um little yatty back in the day um the remix for it though what was it tame impala and little yatty they did like a remix oh was it called was it borderline it might have been borderline no it's okay it's the album slow rush i think it was the track i don't know which one which one it was though i think it was a track of it was an album of remixes so let me see if I can find it here. Bear with me a second. There we go. Slow Rush remixes. And it was uh, Breathe Deeper. That's the one. So Houdini sounds a little bit like Breathe Deeper. So I should have clocked it before, but it sounded so... Di like, once I saw the name, it made sense, but it didn't sound like a quintessential Tame Impala track, if you, if you get me. So maybe there was a lot of 50-50 collaboration between um, Danielle and Kevin Parker in terms of producing the track, but God damn it, man. When that beat, when it goes in... Digga, 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 then. oh so fucking good and the thing about duet leaper as well i think it's similar to doja cat as an artist 
maybe not the most incredible artist in the world. You know, she's not gonna, she's not, she you know, she's not, um, what you, how do I say it? Shaka Doja Cat in terms of like, even though she's not incredible, incredible, she still leaps and bounds better than everybody else. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. Like she doesn't hold a candle to Madonna or something, right? Fair enough. No one's, you know, again, it's a, it's a fucking incredible high bar to hold someone to anyway. But she's still so much better than her contemporaries that it she just reminds you subtly with this little throwaway. Because you know, if this is a track that she put out as like a, hey, this is a single for an up-and-coming untitled mixtape. So I'm, I'm up-and-coming untitled album. Can you imagine the heat is that going to be on that album when it eventually drops? She's been on vacation all over the world. She's been walking on. She's been walking on fucking fashion week runway, um, catwalks and stuff. She's been just living, enjoying life. You know, um, swapping saliva with men all over the world and stuff like. She's been living life good. So she's probably come back with some nice experiences, some vibes, some music, some tones, some some whatever she's going to put into the album. So you know this just might be one of those throwaways but it's in an album full of bangers so i can only imagine what it's going to be sounding like when it eventually does drop but like i said before like she's not even again for me not to level of like you know those old contemporaries that even a uh, kylie minogue doesn't come close but she's still so much better than the, than the rest of her peers similar to that doja cat doja cat might not be as good as she thinks she is but she's still better than most of the girls in the class without a shadow of a doubt and still been close and houdini is a good example for it for dua lipa like i've been banging this single like since it dropped oh my god it's so fucking good and i can't wait to work it into a mix i actually got some mix ideas for the track and it kind of made me think a little bit of what are the mix ideas i had here um it kind of made me think of the obviously the famous track um no i think it's is it 117 yeah it's um uh love will save the day by whitney houston uh papa was a rolling stone george michael um kim appleby don't worry um shirley Raf shirley lee Raphael, so so Sh shirley lee ralph um in the evening there's a few of them that kind of have that kind of vibe but oh it just sounds so good i hope someone does a good remix to it maybe god jansen might jack it and do a god jansen refix on it because it deserves it um you know who do a really good remix of this actually tiger and woods i'm not too sure if they're still putting out stuff because they were my go-to new disco um you know remixer and dj to kind of listen to i'm not sure if they even do stuff anymore because i haven't seen a production for them in a long time but tiger and woods if they did something with them as a remix for houdini that would sound absolutely incredible what, had they put a last single oh they did they put out a single in 2013 called cotton and silk it came out in march actually okay this is so old what does it sound like <laughs> okay whatever but you get the gist in there so um hopefully we get some good remixes from them because i feel like that's one thing that's been lacking a lot when it comes to these good pop singles like you know obviously kali Merg padam came out i don't think there's a good mix of that even there's another good track on that album called tension that doesn't get enough credit that there's no good remixes of that um i hope that someone puts out a good remix of this even i think of the old caroline palachek album there wasn't enough good remixes of her tracks as well there needs to be more because a lot of the pop girls out there aren't, of course, don't hold a candle to their legends, but they're putting out some decent singles. They deserve some good fucking remixes. I wish I could produce to a level that would make sense so I could put out my own remixes for them, but and it doesn't have to be something too crazy. It just needs to kind of hold the essence of the track itself, but just make it punchier, make it faster. Do you know what I mean? Like, dun, 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 dun. like oh, honestly, Houdini is so good. Check out Evan already. Do a leap of Houdini out now on all digital streaming platforms. If you haven't checked it out, what are you doing? What are you doing? Okay, moving on from that one, let's talk about some club stuff. So, number one, courtesy of DJ Mag. So, big up DJ Mag, big up DJ Mag. We've got this news. It says, new music focused venue called Echo Bar opens up in Bray in Ireland. And I, for one, am adding this to my list because I said before, one of the things I did when I first got into dance music, when I first started DJing, is I basically used it as an excuse to travel the world and to find out all these cool, interesting places to go and check out just because I wanted to go into clubs. Because usually, I found 
some of the best clubs in the world are usually the most interesting places or sometimes vice versa so you can sometimes have a really easy way of kind of exploring the country based on the clubs and sometimes you go there and you think you know what well, I don't even like the club I just want to like the, I just love the country so it's a good way just to kind of get yourself out of your comfort zone and go somewhere new so I've never been to Ireland I'd love to visit and I think this might be a good option to go because this looks really really cool um, let's continue it says there's a new space opening up in the east coast of Ireland Echo Bar opened this month um, on the weekend of Bray Seafront in Colwick it was that in Colwick Lock no, Wick Low, sorry, by Irish DJ and producer The Drifter. The Mave Records co-founder announced his plans for a new focus bar on Instagram last week, the 8th, writing, we need more places to dance. Wick Low and South Crawley, Dublin, lack music and his echo to help. I love that. I love that that is a thing nowadays where, you know, you don't currently see there's a place for you to kind of go and chill this is some music, especially the type of music that you like, so you just put it on. And I've been thinking about it myself a lot recently because of the parties i need to just go back out there and start promoting again and start throwing my own events because i think we are missing a really sexy cool fun house type of rave in london we're missing it we've got a lot of really good i'd call them sexy techno dark parties right i've been to a few of them but there's not a lot of like bright fun ones housey ones even that's what i want to do so i want to do something around that kind of you know in that kind of lane so i'm actually thinking about doing an event very very soon i think that's what i'm gonna try and do but it always comes from a point of view of like hey it's not an event where i can go to where i can listen to some really great house music it's all kind of the same sort of techno stuff so maybe i'll do it myself so i love that kind of way of thinking it continues here echo bar will open on thursdays through sundays and host djs on fridays and saturdays opening weekend programming as helmed by the drifter and the house of disco head man um the house of disco go ahead Maginia um, this new space has welcomed positive news of the embattled Irish nightlife scene after a hard won um, overhaul of the island's licensing law was confirmed April 2022 Tayosesh Leo Varakada dwindled hopes the late openings will be taken in place before end of 2023 so they've got really strict opening hours, it seems like. Still, as they've been progressing in areas like resourcing funding, like a soundproof initiative for venues to anticipate the 6 a.m. closing, Ireland has also launched an annual nighttime econo economy forum and the city of Dublin currently seeking its higher nighttime um, advisor. In August, a group of Dublin-based musicians and collectives band together to open a letter, um, to write an open letter, sorry, no, Banded together to open a new cooperative DIY space, sorry. Um, Index celebrated its opening in a venue in September. Does it, is it me? Am I reading this wrong? I just feel like it's been written by an AI or something. Hmm. I don't know. Okay. Sorry about that, uh, Marissa Sitin. But it's, I don't know, maybe it's just me reading out loud. I sound fucking horrible. Um, more information here. You've got more pictures of the Echo Bar. It looks really cool. Loads of wood. November openings, the Drifter, Maginia playing there, a new space to dance. I want to see more images of the actual space itself. Though. Okay, we've got more images here. Let's actually go to Instagram too. Let's get this open up on the next screen because I want you to see more images of it. Let's see if we've got more text about it too. Any more text? Nope, no more text. Cool. So it's open now in, what is it called? In the suburbs of Dublin. So let's see what they're actually saying here in terms of the Instagram because I'm curious to see what it actually looks like on the inside let's see what they're saying here let's see what they're saying no okay not a lot of, not a lot of pictures but we kind of get a gist of what it's about um you see the wood you see the great dj booth you see the speakers you see the disco ball and then let's check the, the guy's instagram story just in case we've got any more information or details here nothing so far just loads of shout outs and happy he's got some coverage here that's good to see that's good to see but yeah i'm definitely gonna add this to my list of places to go to like i said before i need um another excuse to kind of travel a bit further out than what i usually do now which is basically just berlin um and then of course some festivals happening of course next year too that might as well get me out in different places that i'm gonna be obviously divulging closer to the date when i book them but yeah big up drift i'm um, sorry big up echo bar um in ireland hopefully the opening goes well hopefully the opening goes well moving on from that one moving on from that one let's talk about this yeah so there's this really interesting article courtesy of npr that i want to talk about regarding um berlin's fame nightclubs losing customers in the face of an uncertain future and it also makes me think about this thread i've been reading recently on the Berghain community subreddit where somebody was mentioning how 
they think the vibe of the dance floor has changed a lot post pandemic because of the price increase and you're seeing different people on the dance floor like the makeup of the dance floor has sort of changed um um just the vibe of people and what not what they look like where they're from it's completely changed and altered the vibe of the spaces so no matter you know the door picking stuff doesn't really matter when only a certain group of people can afford to go to a club or certain people from certain different backgrounds or whatever it may be so that kind of permanently affects the way the vibe is in the clubs and stuff which is really unfortunate and it's interesting because in berlin it seems like that's become a thing but i feel like in london it's a bit different i feel like in london it's been a lot of people who have moved on from clubbing it's not that the clubs are expensive because they've always been expensive it's people just have kind of grown up or grown out of it for the most part because i feel like there was a contingent of people there was a small group of people who during the lockdowns nothing changed they were putting on warehouse raves and partying and, and doing whatever they were doing and i feel like a lot of those people um basically are the ones now who are weirdly enough holding the scene together still because they're still the diehard ravers those diehard ravers are the ones that were again partying during the peak of the pandemic didn't give a fuck they were out there putting on events and now that no one is really out anymore they're still the ones turning up week in week in after week um still excited about the same people same parties same lineups and for the most part same clubs but they are the ones weirdly enough holding it together and if anything offering up interesting different ways of approaching raves and parties and all this malarkey and promotion and marketing blah 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 so it's an interesting kind of flip you know like i said in berlin it seems like it's an economic thing in london i think it seems like an adult um you know lifestyle choice thing type of thing that people are doing a little bit they're like hey you know what i'm off of this and because yeah just to end that point so the pandemic people kept raving but then a group of people who saw what was happening and just reacted to it and said you know what i'd rather start a family now i'd rather downscale i'd rather move out in london whatever it may be change different pace whatever i know a few of my friends on the scene who did that who moved to other places to kind of just you know um you know de-relegate deregulate themselves a little bit and not be on this constant rat race grind type of thing especially since you know one of the good things only good thing to come out of lockdown was the fact that we now can all work from home so or that's now become like an allowed thing because before it wasn't really a thing that was really um permitted in most workplaces it was something that was kind of given as a bit of a treat um if you performed well whatever maybe or just reserved for the upper management but now that's become a thing you got people that are basically taking their london salaries and moving to fucking manchester and shit which is fucking awesome so you know when you move over there yes they've got a clubbing scene as well but it's not as maybe as crazy as ours so you can maybe afford to kind of you know ch chill out a little bit and calm your horses a bit so i'm interested to see what the different vibe is on here so it's courtesy of um, npr um let's read the article here for those who haven't experienced it a night out in berlin can be reduced to a math equation whose first variable is the best club you've been to the quote Berlin's nightlife is, let's say, what you've experienced, multiply that by 10, says Zach, whatever his surname is, or often known as DVS1. Oh, is that his name? Okay, I forgot. Zach. Okay, I, I didn't know Zach, that was, his, that was his surname. So I guess he's Polish or something, right? Um, or something along those kind of lines. The, um, Eastern European or Central European. Anyway, it continues. Berlin nightlife is very free, he says. It's trying to push artistic boundaries. It's trying to push personal boundaries. It's trying to let people know, um, sorry, let people experience music, art, culture with some rules. But those rules are created to have no rules, which is very true, right? Once you get past the fucking picky, um, you know, um, what you call it, pretentious, uh door picking selection and you go inside you realize okay soon after like very rare do you hear people say i got past the door picking and i was, I was like oh it's overrated no you usually it's like oh i get it now i get why you make such a fuss about letting certain type of people in and certain people not in because the vibe is in there immaculate like i've still yet to see one person fighting on a dance floor in berlin ever and again i've, I've been there i don't I haven't lived there but i've been there enough to have a big sample size i've not seen one fight um it continues, DBS1, who holds a residency at Berlin Club Berghain, says he's heard complaints lately from club owners and promoters in Berlin about the declining numbers of club goers. Even Berghain, typically an, an anomaly because it draws crowds from around the world, has raised its cover charges to deal with the rising cost. He thinks fewer Europeans are making quick clubbing trips to Europe to, um, to the city due to financial hit on the pandemic. I can agree with that. I think a lot of it is what has to do with the fucking accommodation. The accommodation in Berlin now is so expensive, bro. Like, unless you want to live in somebody's house and live in a fucking private room um, on an Airbnb, if you want to try and get your own apartment um, or even your own hotel room, 
they're extremely pricey and again i'm at the age now where i'm not really into fucking you know staying in a hostel with 10 people and stuff in one shared room so if you if you not if that's not an option because hostels are still there which are fairly cheap but if you don't want to go to a hostel most hotels for a weekend trip you're looking at 300 euros plus maybe the same if not more on airbnb if you're looking for a private apartment so it's really really expensive now before it was like half of that it was like 150 for like a europe for like a one for like a one weekend trip and i mean a weekend trip maybe even for like from like friday to fucking monday morning um that's like a weekend you know you go over there you could easily get one for like 150 euros now it's like double if not more than that so that makes it far harder to go if you're an experienced quote-unquote clubber and shit it continues um the quote so where casual weekend to berlin before the pandemic was a simple decision and paying the cover and eating food and taking taxis and then getting home before you have to go to work on monday was really easy to do in europe um i think it became harder to pandemic. home said agree and that's something i realized too when i went last um i wasn't club hopping as much i thought i would be but i didn't end up club hopping as much i went to a couple of clubs but i didn't go to all the clubs i'm gonna go to i think in the past i would have because i would have been able to ping around in fucking taxis easily because it's cheap and i also been able to go in them because it's cheap too but most clubs in Berlin, or in Berlin, sorry, are now the standard kind of London prices now, which is twenty euros, which is basically twenty pounds. Um, but yeah, our clubs are crazy because even twenty pounds isn't isn't enough to get into some places. Some places you have to bring thirty um, to get in, which is crazy. And so that's thirty without even you know putting your jacket in, without getting a drink. So by the time you get your first drink in, you might have already spent a hundred euros fucking wild so it's the same as applying in berlin which i think maybe is probably about 60 50 euros out for the night out so you're, it's still a bit tough but i think one thing they do really well they do they're really tight i feel like berliners when they rave so they're very conscious of their spending they don't go willy-nilly spending crazy so if they do go out you know they might pre-drink they might buy some drinks at this fucking spat on the way there um you know stop at every single one before they get to the venue to get a bit licked up maybe sneak a drink in um you know and, and then maybe buy maybe have a budget to buy one or two while they're there and, and then of course a lot of them too don't like to mix alcohol with their drugs they're very you know disciplined with that regard i think more so than us in the uk we're a bit more crazy and that might actually help things and of course a lot of them cycle they might walk back to home they might take public transport all that stuff is relatively cheap if not free if you don't pay for your ticket and shit so maybe there are ways to get around it but i feel like as a tourist for me personally i did really see that my money wasn't going as far as it was before like i really was basically spending quite a bit of money to go there so which is why i'm not going as often before because before the pandemic i was there was one year i went like four times in one year do you know what i mean like now i'm just going like once if not twice a year which is really really crazy um it continues berlin club commission chair lutz the surname says before the pandemic a third of tourists came to the city's city nightclubs they typically spent 1.6 billion per year while they were here i um, mean 2021 to 2022 5.5 five million tourists came to berlin 30 percent fewer than the previous pandemic numbers but declining tourism isn't the only problem the quote you have inflation you have an energy crisis and you have also the rise of the minimum wage um uh lutz um whose group represents berlin's clubs is founded by them and acts as a lobbying uh, body for them in front of the city's federal government there's also less demand because fewer people are in the city. People don't spend so much money because of inflation is very critical time. It's true. Um, maybe there isn't. I think I noticed that too when I was when I went to the first like Berghain event post pandemic there was a, definitely a decrease in the amount of people there it was not as busy as it always. Don't get me wrong, it's still busy, but it wasn't as busy as it was post pandemic or pre-pandemic sorry post-pandemic yeah pre-pandemic was way busier um all across the board i think it doesn't matter what club you went to it could be in club division there you would have seen it fucking heaving but now at times it's not so much and again they have a lot of options there it's spread you know you can fucking rave all the way um throughout the day and the weekend and whatnot but there's definitely less people around than before um and i hope it's not a morbid reason like they all died from fucking covid and shit that'd, that'd be horrible a critical time too because of how berlin is developing as european metropolis the quote i think that in berlin much more in other cities there is a deep connection between nightlife and urban development 100 percent agree with that tobias rap oh he's, he's the author of that book i've got um called lost and sound berlin techno and the easy jet sat and the easy jet set i actually bought it accidentally in german i need to get it again in fucking english it's a legendary book um it kind of was one the, the one the first one 
ones that sort of depicted the whole techno tourism thing as well anyway, from back in the day um it continues here Rap says Berlin's club scene is an, is, is an outgrowth of how the city developed after the fall of the Berlin Wall and Germany's reunification more than three years, decades ago. In the years... <coughs> In the years after the reunification, one third of East Berlin was empty, recalls rap. There was nobody living there. It was a ghost town. So young people like me and others who took spaces, you have empty warehouses and an old factory that is empty and you go in and you squat in and you say, this is ours. And you have this huge space and say, what can I do with this? You make a party. And now it's not so much, isn't it? You, you rarely if ever hear about underground raves. I know they still exist. I know they do. But you don't really hear them happening. I know when I was here and watching stuff from afar, like a fucking voyeur in Berlin, I did see a few of them doing raves just outside of Berlin. There's like these weird like bunker things. I guess they were built around the war um, where people were throwing these illegal raves out. But you don't really hear about a lot of them nowadays as much because I guess it's just too bait in it. You can't really avoid people kind of finding out about your illegal rave because, you know, the people in Berlin look a certain way and if they're all heading in one direction, it's pretty easy to spot where the party's at. It continues here. Berlin's clubs evolved from life on the margins. In the early 1990s, these Berlin nightclubs popped up in their band breweries and power stations. None of this was safe and rap considers this a minor miracle that there wasn't a horrible fire of accidents inside of these makeshift clubs. Eventually, investors in the city began to take note. They worked together to build legal, licensed clubs and other businesses began to arrive the quote the side effect that was that it was good for the value of the properties because in lots of areas that were unrun down they were empty and they were not nice and they didn't need a good reputation you suddenly had galleries bars nightclubs that gave the areas great value and with that came young renters who turned into middle-aged homeowners of children and as housing prices were risen burdens transformed gentrified neighborhoods had become less comfortable with less with the city's clubs and their subculture I still would that's the one part of gentrification that always kind of makes me laugh in it you you specifically move to an area because of the bustling nightlife and then you get there and you complain about the bustling nightlife you want to shut it down it's like huh but anyway um just down the block from berlin's infamous fetish and sex club the kit kat club um undine a resident who critical of the club and who only gave her first name for the fear of retribution from club goers and the club owner points out the the distrust of the previous evening okay let's see what they have to say this is from an uh, a person that isn't for clubs i'm curious to hear their perspective they say this as follows you should take a photo of all the trash and the clubbers have left behind she says nobody picks it up nobody cares i've complained several times to the police about the noise and the rowdiness of the early hours of the morning from this club okay that's fair to be fair that might be an exception because that's one thing i think i've seen i don't really see a lot of there's not a lot of like loitering around clubs in berlin people just <coughs> people just kind of leave <coughs> i feel like or they go to different spots but they're not really it's not as like crazy as it is in london people in london go mad when they're outside of a club it's like they're steaming eager for an excuse to go crazy somewhere else or just making noise for the sake of it so i don't really see that attitude a lot in berlin but it might make sense at kit kat because kit kat is also a very touristy club even though it's a sex fetish club which is a bit of a niche in itself it's still very touristy right it's kind of one of the most popular clubs there aside from Bergheim. so it makes sense maybe that why they have that kind of a weird um you know behavior from people Complaints like this are on the rise in Berlin as cities' housing prices go up and urban spaces become tighter but for Zach the DJ is clear who should get the free pass the quote who was there first he asked exactly that's my that's my thing too who was there first? If the club was there first, you can't. Uh, why can't the club be protected the same way that if apartment building was there first and the club moved in? Exactly because if the club, if the, no, let's continue his quote, who was there first? If the club was there first, why can't the club be protected in the same way that if an apartment building was there first and the club moved in? Well, in this case, the club were there first. The culture was there first. And I think it's important to protect those things first. Exactly. I wish that was the sensible approach to doing things or maybe even just a mediation or something in between. But it's never the case. It's usually the club is there first. Everyone moves there because of the bustling nightlife, cultural, art, scene, whatever it may be. But it does involve a lot of fucking activities after 6 p.m. But then the people that then move there, um, you know, get annoyed by the fucking noise or the realities of living in a place that's bustling. And they then start to put in petitions to close things down. And sometimes it goes far as to get the thing closed down. And then it's like, hey, you move to this area to do what then? To live in a rundown area with no bustling cultural nightlife scene around there at all. Is that what you actually wanted? 
Interesting. So they love to bend to every desire of the residents, but don't do it for the fucking clubs that actually are the ones basically increasing the value of that area and bring people there in the first place. There should be a way to mediate it, whether it's by increasing the amount of soundproofing and whatever it may be, whether it's finding them if they have, you know, and social behavior, so also on the club to make sure the patrons are behaving, whatever it may be. There has to be some level of um, cooperation to make it work because at the moment, this one-sided affair with gentrification is so annoying. It continues. The Berlin Club Commission is, in fact, seeking the type of protection that the city offers its museums, opera houses, and other cultural institutions so that it can survive its current and any further turndowns. Such protection includes city subsidies and tax breaks. Near midnight on a Thursday at Berlin's Bergheim Club, there is no line. Maybe it's too early. Maybe the times are tough. Despite this, when Andrea Shib Shibaja and her friends approach the bouncer he shakes his head directing them the way out <laughs> oh bless them I, I guess it's them right this is the guys that didn't get into Bergen unfortunately um, and again look they're all wearing black right they've got the quintessential outfit on so don't think it's a black thing um, they're Costa Rican who live in Boston and they flew to Berlin because Bergen was on the bucket list I want the people that usually wears black and I feel like oh maybe I'm part of that I want to hang out with people with the same vibe as me reject it Shabai said shaking his head Shabai is still in a state of shock and lingers outside in the cold watching others casually walk inside past the bouncer who just turned her and her friends away when she hears that berlin clubs are complaining about fewer club girls she drops her jaw but at the same time they reject you she says so you're like well that's what's the point i'm coming all the way here for this and then they're turning their back on you i'm just going to spend my money somewhere else but that's the thing that is beautiful about that place right and it's something that's a bit odd they they do that because obviously the vibes are more important on the inside but that kind of selective that 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 ability that is it's a it is a kind of a privilege that they can do that basically that's basically what i'm saying because i think in most cities if you treated your customers the way berlin Berghain does or berlin does in general people just would refuse to go back they don't want to put themselves through that ringer anymore right they would just kind of refuse to go back and that's you kind of basically done but if anything most likely these costa ricans from boston will probably figure out a way to come back again one other time and try to get back in again and it'll become part of their fucking law it become part of their fucking you know topical conversation their friendship group it becomes something that they'll have on their bucket list forever until they cross that bad boy off and then even if they do get in it'll probably become a drug that they'll then be unable to not stop themselves taking so it does create a really interesting kind of a relationship between the clubber and the fucking club itself um but you know in any other place that's what makes it beautiful because in any other place if you've got the money you can get in there it's like they don't care about the money even if sometimes when it's empty, they'll purposely reject people just for the fuck of it. That's also kind of funny as well. But um, it is kind of true what they're saying, though. I have kind of seen, especially in London, there's definitely been a change in the makeup of people when you go out. It's not the same as it was before. Before, it was a very, I would say, very, it was much more variety in the people, much more diverse, maybe in terms of backgrounds. Forget race, sexuality and shit, just in terms of, you know, upbringing and background and whatnot. Just from what you can see from your naked eye, it looked way more diverse. Nowadays, you see the same type of person, right? You see the basically the techno weekend warrior out every single weekend. It's not really much more apart from than that, except for maybe tourists, which has kind of made it a bit boring. But hey, what can we do? What can we do? So that has been it for now. That is the Exo Zing Show episode number seven two three. A little bit of a short one today before I just jump in and give you a bit of my culture updates and those type of topics that you heard. If you've enjoyed the pod and you liked what you've seen, like what you heard, make sure you smash the like button that below for watching this real live stream. If you're will listen to this in the audio side of things, you'll see all the links or the topics I spoke about in the description. You'll also see a link to the my social medias as well in the description. And if you can, you listen to it all by the other side of things. If you can, you got some time, please leave me a five star review on the platform that you're listening on. That'll really help in terms of getting me boosted up there up the charts and stuff and get me some opportunities to make some money hey eh? money 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 to buy some yeah you know anyway so thank you so much if you can leave me a five star review that'd be greatly appreciated for now i'm gonna have to love you and leave you all you should hear my tune today playing out underneath my voice as i leave thank you for joining me so far and i'll see you guys again very soon peace <laughs>